that anybody may have. All right, well, it's good to have all of you here today. We have uh, not necessarily uh, a, a guest speaker. Trey Sheeran has spoken before. Don is out of town today, so uh, Trey graciously agreed to step in. He's spoken in the first service and heard nothing but good things, and he will speak again in the second service. So, uh, a couple of just little housekeeping items, some things I got wrong. If you'll look at your bulletin, it says uh, God of our fathers, and then there's a chorus. We're going to move that chorus uh, after Now I Belong to Jesus. It'll be on the screen, uh, but right before Paul prays, we'll have that chorus right there. So uh, with that being said, let's just take a quick moment. Let's all stand and greet each other.
All right, let's find our seats and we'll begin worship. But everything that was a gain to me, I have considered to be a loss because of Christ Jesus. Let us begin worship. She fooled me. I thought she was almost done but about two minutes ago. So I have put in a request for when the saints come marching in, I want that to be played as one of her preludes. So I've asked twice. It hasn't happened. Maybe some of you might mention it to her. I don't know. But I evidently can't get it done. But that's one of my favorite ones that she plays. Our fathers trusted in you, and you rescued them. Let's all stand. We're going to sing God of our fathers. We'll sing all four verses.
Because of what Jesus Christ has done for you with his blood, Christ himself is our way of peace. He has made peace between Jews and Gentiles by making us all one family. Now you are no longer strangers to God and foreigners to heaven, but you are members of God's very own family, citizens of God's country, and you belong to God's household. What a foundation you stand on now, the apostles and the prophets. Cornerstone of the building is Jesus Christ himself. We who believe are carefully joined together with Christ as parts of a beautiful, constantly growing temple for God. You are joined with him and with each other by the Spirit in our heart of his dwelling place of God. You are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Hymn number 503 will sing verses 1 and 3, followed by our chorus, Lead Me Lord. Jesus, my Lord, will love me forever from Ransom my soul, now I belong to 
here in both services, but as John has told me, that on the internet last Sunday, now I'm counting, it's counting both services, there were 98 people that viewed our service, which is wonderful, okay? I want to pray for them too. All right, if you would go to prayer with me. Heavenly Father, we ask for blessings upon each and every person here and every person that is out in the internet world that is listening and taking this in. We wish they would uh, pick up on the uh, uh, fellowship that they would have of Christians by being here and of this great communion that we're about to partake. May we investigate our souls and minds about our sins before we do and come to peaceful terms with you, Jesus. Help this church to grow. Help us to find ways of helping other people just like we have reached out to help veterans, veterans that are homeless. But there are many, many other people. And just like Christ came uh, to earth, the angels were singing peace on earth. And it's very important today. We wish that the people of Russia would understand about Jesus and about peace on earth and not create a war. We now lift up the prayer your son taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. feed see what it looked like so yes that one of those was me so you could probably take that one off I would 97, 97 yeah, yeah so. I am guilty of that so I have watched the service many times uh, and uh, I have noticed there was a week in particular where there were hundreds that had logged in uh, Lori was watching it on her computer and I was watching it on my computer so that's two so I, I don't know how you keep up with that but I do know that there was a week when there were hundreds so that's great. And to each of you that are watching us live, we're so thankful that you're doing that and hope that someday soon you can come worship with us in person. As we go to communion, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. A great communion song, hymn number 404. We'll sing the first two verses. Eat and remember the wounds that heal and death. 
This is the table of the king, that he gave it all for us, that he shed his blood so that we might avoid the power and the penalties of sin, that as we take the bread, we remember that the sacrifice he gave was for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning, Good morning. and welcome to the Lord's table. What a marvelous, wonderful place to be to start out the week, sharing communion with our Lord and Savior and amongst ourselves, our church family. I claim Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, but I know God is much bigger than that. Christ dwells within me and also billions of people around the world. Jesus Christ is big enough to share with the world. And when I say billions, that's billions with a B. So our mandate from Christ is to go out and share the world. Hopefully one day when all the world has had a chance to receive Jesus as their personal Savior, Jesus will return to take us home. Jesus desired to have a meal with the disciples, those that he loved. It was to be his last meal. Toward the end of the service, after prayers, after sharing, Jesus took the tape from the table, just simple bread. He said, this bread represents my body. My body is to be broken for you. Take it, eat. And likewise, Jesus took the cup and after blessing the cup, he said, this cup represents my blood. My blood is to be shed for you for the forgiveness of your sin and for the sins of many others. Take it, drink.
Let's all stand. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Father. We return to you a portion of your abundant blessings to us. We pray that this will be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Be seated. I think I would have I just set up down here because man, there's no problem. I'll, yeah. yeah. It'd be a little more closer. I feel like I'm uh, in the outfield and uh, trying to talk, yell at home base, you know. But uh, but I appreciate you guys. We had a beer today. And uh, but you get to enjoy two worship services really good. One thing about speaking both services. We got, we got some great musicians, great talent here. So that, that's exciting, man. But, uh, but you know, uh, Today we're going to talk about what is spiritual leadership. And, and kind of, you know, it's a thing to where a lot of confusion. Uh, you know, I came to Christ, I was 21, 37 years ago, this month. The last service I forgot, I said 35 years, but I forgot I'm 58 now. Did y'all forget about your age? Did anybody ever skip your birthday and thought you were just a year younger? Yeah, y'all don't do that, do you? 
<laughs> That's one way to stay young, but, uh, but yeah. But, uh, but no, 37 years ago, I came to Christ, you know, and, and, and had a lifestyle, three dealer guys, lost a football scholarship, got my knee tore up, and uh, I got to a point where I like, man, I, I got to surrender. And so I didn't know that I really was born again. I thought I just made Jesus Lord of my life. Because you got this deal where you can just pray and get salvation. And then later on you can make Jesus Lord. But Jesus is Lord. You know? So you don't, we don't, I don't, I didn't make nothing. I just surrendered and come under his lordship. And he changed my life. So that's when I really started to grow as a, as a believer when I was 21. Like, and then started reading the word. Started uh, sharing my faith. Getting in, in Bible study. And, and, and I started this path, you know, with spiritual leadership. But, uh, and I, I had some misconceptions about it. Man. I thought it was a knowledge thing, you know. I, I, I got to know a lot to be a spiritual leader. And so, you know, you ask yourself the question, am I a spiritual leader? And then you, then you answer the question, why am I or why am I not? And so the, those are really important because uh, it's going to determine how we live our lives. If we think spiritual leadership is based on knowledge, then we're going to pursue knowledge. If we think spiritual leadership is based on uh, uh, doing things, then we're going to try to do a lot of things or being good. And these things really can't transform us. Jesus transforms us to the power of the Holy Spirit, and then out of that, we start doing his work. But if we do the work to be transformed, he says when he sent the 72 out, they came back, they're all excited. He said, don't rejoice that the demons submit to you. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. That's the mindset. We got to rejoice in our salvation. But, and, and, and how do we do that? That's what we're going to look at today. You know, last week, Don, I don't know if you remember Don's last, uh, or number three point, <clears throat> and I had to look at my wife's notes, and I remember part of it. But Don said, a church that thrives is a five and two ministry that is driven by divine compassion. And, and he, he highlighted, I don't know if he in the service, but he highlighted a couple of verses. One was Isaiah 43, 7, that it says, we are made to give God glory. We are created to give God glory. That's our purpose, to give him glory. And, and going back a chapter, Isaiah 42, 8 says, God will not give his glory to another. He will not give his praise to idols. So God is a jealous God. And, and to think that we could have something to do to give him glory. Have you ever been to Grand Canyon? I remember the first time I went to Grand Canyon. Well, the only time I went to Grand Canyon. Might have been the second time. But anyway. But uh, we were coming back from Oregon. So let's go, let's go by the Grand Canyon. And uh, we're driving around. I, I, didn't, I thought, man, this, there's a lot of trees, you know, a little forest, a little trail, whatever. We're driving through. I thought, man, where's the Grand Maybe we're lost. We, we didn't have GPSs. You know, I didn't have one back then. And all of a sudden, man, we, there's this little cutout, like a little parking lot, and boom, there it is, man. It's just like endless, and, and the depth, and the huge, it just takes your breath away. And that, that's, that's nothing compared to God. And you look at the universe, and the heavens, and the black holes, and all these galaxies we've, we've discovered, how far, I mean, it's so vast, so huge, he made that stuff with his voice. How can we give him glory? You know, that, that's, that's, a, that's a great question to ask. How can we give God glory? That's what we're going to look at today. Because we, we can. He created us to give him glory. And how do we do that? And so today I'd like to give us uh, three keys to becoming a spiritual leader. So we can become the kind of people, like Don was talking about, they had, they, they had a, there's, there's 5,000 men, and we don't know how many women and kids, at least over 10. When, when, they, when he fed the multitude there. And, and, and they only had five loaves and then two, two of the fish. So, so these disciples, they gathered, look what they had. They gave to Jesus. How, 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 do, how do you feed that many people to do that? Well, he has to multiply. That, that's, a, that's a spiritual principle of multiplication that Jesus and God, they've been doing it for forever. The, uh, Isaiah 60, 22 <clears throat> says, the least shall become a thousand, the smallest, a mighty nation. That's God's principle forever. He started with Abraham and, and Sarah. These, these 
older people, I'm going to build a nation out of you for my glory. So that, that's God always does that. He multiplies what we have. He did it on the day he fed the 5,000 with the five and two. He wants to do it here today with us. He wants to take what little bit we have, and there's an overwhelming need, and we just step into that and do his work. And we don't know how it's going to happen. That's the faith he wants to see. That's, that's, what a, that's what the spiritual leadership is. And the first point is the lifestyle of investing in people. In, in, in the beginning of Luke, Gospel of Luke, he, uh, he shares this. We're going to look at Luke 3 after this. But why did Luke write the Gospel of Luke? And, you know, I saw this the other week. I read Luke many times. But reading verse 1, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. You know, the first thing he says, many, many have written accounts, not just those three other accounts, John, Mark, and, and Matthew, but there's other people writing about Jesus. <clears throat> so with all this material written about Jesus, and Luke says, I, I want to investigate it. Why, why, why do you want to do that? And Luke's gospel is meticulous, very detailed. You know, he was a doctor, later became a missionary. They think he came to Christ. Maybe the church of Antioch, there at Luke 11, <clears throat> began following Paul around on all of his journeys. He was geographically correct. He paid attention to little details. His gospel is uh, really, really strong. People say, you know, he was a great historian, theologian. And uh, why would he write this gospel? There's many accounts out there. You know, I think, man, if I want to write a book, I want, I want to be a bestseller, sell millions of copies, you know. And, and then I know it's successful. Especially Luke went through so many details. He wrote, he wrote Acts also by volume. Luke wrote the majority of the New Testament by words. Just those two, two books there. And so he says, with this in mind, since I myself carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. You know, that's incredible. The first step of being a spiritual leader is this heart to invest in an individual. That's, that's what loving God, loving people is about. And, and Don shared that last week about the great commandment in Mark 12 that love God, love people, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, love your neighbor as yourself. These are two pillars that, that we operate out of. And Luke shows it here. <clears throat> His detailed account of this gospel and the book of Acts also was lit, written to Theophilus was for one person. One person. That, that's tremendous to me. Because a lot of times, if I was to study and write real hard, it wouldn't be for one person. It'd be come here today and preach to a group of people or first service, you know, too. And, and you know, that's why I would do it, for, for a bunch of people. He went through this great extreme care for one person. That is the nature of what Jesus demonstrated, the value of one individual. You think about John 4, the gospel of John, and the one at the well. She was a spiritual leader day one. She comes in contact with Jesus. She six relationships, passed. She was there alone. This ostracized woman, and then she brings back the whole town to meet Jesus. That's incredible. He took care of one person. And she became a spiritual leader that day. So we don't ever know the impact of one individual. But that's got to be a heart. You know, and so a lot, a lot of times the church, they're so focused on reaching all these people. And they forget the one. And so they don't have an individual-based ministry. And people get left out of the, of the deal. They don't get cared for. You know, it's hard. People, people need shepherding because you got deaths. You have, you have a, a marriage. You got family. You got, you got all these issues in life because of sin. And we need people to invest in people. That's why we need spiritual leadership. That's why we need more and more. And so you're never too old, you're never too young. It's you, you bring what you got for one person. Now, could you do that for one? 
And that, that's a challenge to us, man. Because a lot of times we think, man, my life doesn't matter unless I average a thousand. No. Luke wrote to one. That was his motivation. And he, he's reached millions. God multiplied that. That's the mustard seed of the faith. That's the least should become a thousand, the smallest of my nation. That's that principle. The value of an individual is huge. And I get emotional, but it's, it's just the mindset that um, I, I, I've had expectations in my life where I thought I was a failure because I didn't reach more. Or things didn't happen like I wanted. But there were individual lives changed. I've seen it happen. And I would discount that work. And other people would too, you know. But that's not how God looks at it. And so with, with this mindset, 300 years after Jesus' death, the Mediterranean world, the cities, they say 50% of those cities were, were Christian now. And you, and you read Acts, you read the rest of the, 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 the New Testament, and there's not a lot about ministry in there. It's more about this new life in Christ. That's, that's, that's what they're talking about. How do you live like? How do you, how do you understand your salvation? How, how do you understand how to live? How do, you, how do you move out of sin? And Paul would talk to people. He says, 1 Corinthians 3, I can't dress you as spiritual, but as worldly, we're in Christ. So th these people, they, they had up and downs. They weren't perfect. But they transformed their world. That's what a spiritual leader is. The heart of the individual. The second part of spiritual leadership is a lifestyle of repentance. And we think about repentance, but we usually think about uh, coming to Christ. This, we repent from our sin, we turn and follow Christ, and then we're done with repentance. Martin Luther said, he said, his quote is, uh, when our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said repent, <clears throat> he called for the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. Your entire lifestyle. That is a key for a spiritual leader, a lifestyle of repentance. Because why? Not, not that we're just, some, we're just in some major uh, disobedience and, and, and we've gone back. Because John, 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to cleanse us and purify us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1 says, you claim to be without sin that you're a liar. He's ready. He's writing to believers. So as believers, we're not done with sin. It's still on us. So we have to continually turn away, confess, and live for Christ. A lifestyle of repentance. It never goes away. In, in Psalm 51, David talks about this. And uh, he says, uh, restore to me the joy of my salvation. So he talks about, hey, not to get salvation. He wants the joy back because he, he, he had sinned, he disobeyed. So restore the joy of salvation, he says, a broken, contrite heart is what you want, this, this broken individual that needs. And so this lifestyle repentance, in, in, in Luke chapter 3, he, uh, John is baptizing, and Luke, and we'll start there in verse 3, 3, he says, went to all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it was written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked road shall become straight, the rough way smooth, and all the people will see God's salvation. Verse 7, John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him. Now, now in Matthew's account, Matthew 3, same chapter, Matthew 3, he calls some of these people in the crowd, which you'll see the next phrase, he calls them, he says the Pharisees and Sadducees. So Luke, Luke doesn't separate the crowd, he said the crowds. Now in, in Matthew 3, John separates, he said there's Pharisees and Sadducees coming also. And, and he says, you brood of vipers, who warn you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And so these, these rich religious leaders, these Pharisees and Sadducees, they had gotten to a, pos a positional power of spiritual leadership where they're okay. They don't have to repent. They're good. And, and man, Jesus would, would come down hard on these people, the Pharisees and Sadducees. 
he, he tells him all these woes. He says, woe to you. He says, you know, you, you, you strain out one-tenth of your spices to give away, but you neglect justice. You forget about people. He says, you put such a heavy load on people, so many, so many requirements, and you won't even use a finger to lift the load. You brood of vipers. He called them that same thing, too. And, and, but this mindset that these spiritual leaders were trying to control, they were burdening people, they weren't giving them freedom, and they had no life. And that's why, he, that's why John says here, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And he goes on and says, and begin, do not begin to say to yourselves, we are Abraham's father, or Abraham is our father, because God can raise up anybody, so it's not your heritage. And he moves down, he said, anyone who has two shirts, share with the one who has none. Tax collectors can't get baptized. They said, what do we do? You know, they, they repented. They get baptized. So the repentance happens, then they're baptized. So it wasn't like they were, the baptism was the deal. You know, the repentance, just like we did the Lord's Supper, it's, it's a symbol. The baptism was a symbol of repentance. The Lord's Supper, a symbol of Jesus in his last night in the upper room. Remember, remember this in his name. The same thing. So the bad, a lot of times people or, or some groups have said baptism is the key. Baptism is just a ceremony. So, so these people were asking, after they had repented, now they got baptized, now they want to know what to do. And see, the mindset changed. You know, you, in your mind, your heart changes. I, I, want, I want to repent. I want to turn away, start taking actions. Now I want to know what to do. But in a lot of concepts of repentance is like you, you, you work out and then you're good. That's not what repentance is. Repentance is a mind change. It's an internal process that with remorse that we say, man, I'm tired of my way. I'm following God. And then the works come out of that. So that's a big distinction there because baptism was not the deal. It was repentance. <clears throat> they were coming. Now they want to know what to do. And, uh, and you notice, man, the tax collectors, it says, uh, it says, what should I do? It says, don't collect any more than you're required to. They're taking advantage of people, greed. So once we move into this repentance and these works, it's going to be, a lot of it's going to be people-based, taking care of people. Uh, soldiers were there. They said, what should you do? He said, don't extort money. Don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. There was some injustice. They were using people. You've got to turn from that. The people were waiting expectantly for the, and wondering in their hearts if John was the Messiah. <clears throat> and John, here's how John responds. So a lifestyle of repentance. In this next step, John brings out, he says, uh, I can't even touch or untie the straps of his sandals. And then he says there, the second part of verse 16, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And so he brings out the, this, this spiritual birth that Jesus is bringing with the Holy Spirit. Not, not, not a baptism of water, but an immersion into a new way of life through a spiritual rebirth. He talks about it in John 3, being born again, born of the Spirit. That's what he's talking about, this rebirth, this regeneration happens. <clears throat> Jesus was bringing that, and he talked, to his, he talked to his guys about it. He said in John 14 and John 16 that I'm going away, but someone's coming, the, the helper, the counselor. The, the, the third person of the Trinity. He's coming. And I must go so he can come. He's going to bring power. He's going to be the truth. He's going to be your counselor. He's going to, he's going to convict the world of sin, guilt, and righteousness, and all these things. So he, the, the Spirit's power had, had to be a part of the ministry. Well, they didn't have that before. So this new thing. So after a lifestyle of repentance, the third point is a lifestyle of living by the Spirit. And, it, and a lot of times we don't, it's, it's, it's difficult to understand what that means. How do we walk in the Spirit, as it talks about in Ephesians, or, or, or Galatians 5? How do we be filled by the Spirit, it talks about in Ephesians 5? Uh, in Romans 8, 13, it says, put to death the deeds of the flesh by the Holy Spirit. So we, we can't live the Christian life without the Spirit. And how do we, how do we live this life out? And, uh, and this idea of uh, producing fruit in keeping with repentance... Is, is a key. Paul talks about repentance in, in uh, 2 Corinthians 7 9. He, he had to rebuke the Corinthian church. They were doing some, some uh, things that they, they were in sin. And he says, It bothers me that I had to write so harshly to you. 
But now I don't regret that because it led to your repentance. Now you're doing the right things. So, so Paul had to speak to these Corinthians. First Corinthians 3, he says, I couldn't speak to you as mature, but you're babes in Christ. So as a believer, that there are stages of our growth. And the Holy Spirit is going to be taking us through these growth stages. Uh, Hebrews 5, 12 through, through chapter 6 there, he talks about, uh, he says, some of you, sh you should be teachers by now, but you still need milk. And he talks about, you haven't learned how to distinguish good from evil. You need to go back to the elementary principles of the gospel. So returning back to the very foundation where they started, where they were, when they got saved, they, they hadn't learned to walk yet in Christ. So I think, I think a lot of us, that's, that's some, something where we are, or we've been a, been a believer for a long time, and we're kind of feel, feel stuck maybe. We have to start working in this other aspect of, of a Christian life, of, of our salvation. It's called sanctification. And so, this little, I'll show you this little illustration I've got here, if you can see it. <clears throat> got a little board here, and I don't, I don't want to confuse you, but uh, it helps me to have a visible, something visible, because uh, I'm more of a visual learner. But, uh, this little diagram, it's like a kind of like a pyramid. On well, this side is uh, is justification, and the whole thing is uh, it begins either we get in a confrontation or a conviction from the spirit about about sin or about truth or something. And so then, uh, as that happens to us, it moves us to repentance, in confession, and that's all spirit driven. And that and, and then then this one side of this pyramid is justification, the one time act. So regeneration takes place, we're born again, we're a new creation, and then we begin to follow Jesus, and it comes out of loving others, you know, and so we, we begin on our salvation right here. And this, this bottom of this uh, pyramid, love God, love people, God's glory, that's the foundation, that's what we're, 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 we're building this thing on, we talked about earlier, how you love God, how you love people, how do you give God's glory? Becoming Christ, becoming to Christ is one way being born again. Now what do you do? So a lot of times, you know, in our salvation, we, we know we're, we're the righteousness of, of God in Christ. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So in Jesus, we're fully forgiven. But that doesn't mean we're, we're without sin. So now what do we do with this sin? Well, I'm righteous. I'm a child of God. I've been adoption. That's, that's another aspect of justification. But through regeneration, propitiation, I'm no, no longer going to face hell. Reconciliation, now I'm a friend of God. All these things happen. But I still got sin. And that's where a lot of times we get stuck. And we feel this guilt. We feel like, I don't know, measure enough. But we start measuring now. The, now the second part is where repentance comes in again. The same thing happens again. We get we get confronted with truth, we get conviction, we start repent, we confess, and then we start moving to restoration and renewal. In Titus 3, 5, it says, uh, it says, the Holy Spirit, he says, we've been baptized with the Spirit for rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. So it's not because of works, he says, it's because of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. So that happens. Rebirth over here, justification, one time act, when, when, when we're saved, renewal, the other aspect of our salvation, sanctification. We begin to walk in that. And then when there's a walk in that, we walk in the Spirit, we become like Jesus, we do good works, we make disciples, and all of our works flow out of this process of sanctification, becoming like Jesus, being set apart for good works. Now, how do we get set apart for good works? How, and, and Paul says, put to death the deeds of the body. He says, if you cleanse yourself in 2 Timothy, you'll be used for noble purposes. How do we do that? We, we go back again. The truth comes, we repent, we confess, we start moving down restoration, renewal. We carry out God's plan. So you've got to look at your salvation as two things coming down. And eventually, glorification, 
We won't have any presence of sin. But justification, sanctification, how does that all work out? That's Some people, the sanctification truth in Scripture, it looks like if people would teach, you're losing your salvation. But it's not that. It's in the sanctification process. You're repenting, coming to Christ. Because we need rescued the rest of our lives. We need rescued. We need saved every day from sin. What is, what is the Lord's Prayer? The Lord's Prayer is a sanctification prayer. And, and you can see the Lord's Prayer through this. Our Father who art in heaven, to my God's glory, hallowed be thy name. It says, Thy kingdom come from heaven to earth. How do we bring heaven down to earth? We live out this process, becoming like Jesus, because heaven starts coming down. The kingdom's in our heart. <clears throat> we start living out these kingdom lifestyle. The world sees it. It's different. And then uh, that kingdom come, that will be down on earth is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. I'm not talking about food, Jesus. Daily we need Jesus in the sanctification part. We got him in salvation. We still need him in sanctification daily, daily bread. He says, uh, what does it say now? What's next? Dave? Give us our daily bread. Forgive us of our sin, yeah, sin trespass. As we forgive others right here. Sanctification, we're forgiving. We need forgiveness of sin. We need to forgive other sin. That's how we love people. One of the ways we forgive their sin. Um, <clears throat> forgive us our sin. What was it saying? Now lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from the evil one. Now, now we're, we're asking, man, I don't want to go back. Free me up. We're walking in the spirit. I need your power. Don't lead me into temptation. Deliver from the evil one. For what? Nine is the what? Kingdom. 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 Power and glory, man. And we get back to God's glory. They use the sanctification prayer. The early church used the sanctification, used the Lord's Prayer. It was their sanctification prayer. They built their spiritual lives on those principles. That's why Jesus says, this is how you pray. And, 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 you know, when you start seeing these things, you'll see it all through Scripture. This process we got to go through because it's daily bread. It's not a one and done. It's a lifestyle. A lifestyle of individuals, heart for individuals. A lifestyle of repentance and a lifestyle of being spirit-led. That's how we become a spiritual leader. And so we become a church that thrives, a five and two church like, like uh, Don was talking about. We take a little what we have and we give it to Jesus. He multiplies it out around us with compassion. And that's the lifestyle of a, of a spiritual leader. Not based on knowledge, based on those three things. I close the prayer and uh, we'll, we'll finish with the inventory. Father, we come thank you for your word today. Thank you for your truth. And we just thank you that you want us to come to you. You want us to come to you for, for power, for help, and, and you love us. You're a good God. And you don't turn us away because we sin. You, you embrace us in our weakness. We want to be those kind of people. Thank you for this time today in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Trey. You know, over my lifetime, I've had an opportunity to sing over a hundred funerals. And in almost all of those funerals, the Lord's Prayer is continually sung. So I can help you. I'm not a scripture king, but I can help you with the words to the Lord's Prayer. I know that one really well. So I was glad I could contribute. So do many of you remember when we had a revival, it was three or four years ago, we sang this piece, Revive Us Again. We did it for about a month before the revival. And let me read to you what I remember reading before we would sing it. Remember then how far you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. He who conceals his sin does not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces their sin finds mercy. This was our goal before revival. I could come forward every single week and spend all of the time repenting for the stuff I do for the week. Man, I'm awful. And I can assure you, I need this time of repentance. We're going to stand and sing this through. If you feel the need to come and pray, come on. If not, we won't sing but a few verses and then we'll get on out of here. Let's all stand and pray. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, like the glory, hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, like the glory, revive us. The second verse, we praise thee. God for 
Have you chosen a movie yet? Yes. Let me hear. Um, Miracle from Heaven. Uh, yes. Is that where the girl falls in the tree? It, there is a little girl in there, but I haven't seen it yet. Oh, did I just give it away? Sorry. Probably. Sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's a great movie. Yeah, it's a great movie. So anyway. All right. I hope that you'll come and be a part of that. We're going to pray and be dismissed. Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for this service. Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ. Now go with us. Help us to be the people you would have us to be. And bring us all back safely. And all of God's people said, Amen. You're dismissed. <laughs>